thank you very much. We're very excited to be here talking at the Social Ontology 2021 conference. My name is Randall Harp. I'm here with my co-author, Juniper Lovato, and we are going to be presenting on some work that we've done in collaboration with some other colleagues of ours. I'll pull up the slides right now. The paper is called Distributed Consent. And as you can see, uh, our other co-authors on this project are Antoine Lahr, Laurent Hébert Dufresne, and Jeremiah Onalapo. All right, so this is a photo of me and my brothers. It's a family photo. Um, you can see me here as a baby and my brother Todd with this rockin' D&D mullet and my brother Nico. And one of the questions that prompt us to talk about this problem um, in this inquiry was asking whether or not this photo was my data, was mine alone and whether or not I'm really justified in entering into a data transaction of this photo by myself, or do I have some sort of responsibility to, to represent my family when I'm sharing it? Or maybe um, it's more permissible if every single one of us provides our consent if I shared the photo, or maybe there's some regulatory representative that should be in charge of that role. Um, so, in this question, we we're really trying to think about who um, should control the flow of these data. Next slide. So let's talk about what we mean by personal data transactions. In this context, personal data um, includes not just the uploaded content, so in this example, the, the family photo, but also the networked information, um, for example, that I'm related to my brothers, and other personal identifiable information, such as maybe my location or my IP address. Um, and these uh, personal data, there, that's a very broad term. That's something that is exchanged through almost every action that we do. But in this context, we're focusing on those actions and interactions for which the exchange of information is the primary purpose. Next slide. So one of the things that we know with respect to the acquisition of personal data is that it would be morally impermissible in ordinary circumstances without some kind of moral transformation or some kind of permission structure going in the background, right? So we can, we can make an analogy with kind of how surveillance ordinarily works. When we think about surveillance, surveillance, right, surveilling somebody when they have what we consider to be a reasonable expectation of privacy is morally impermissible. And the reason why surveilling someone without their expectation of privacy, the reason why that's impermissible is because the thought is that they are not consenting to the sharing of that information with somebody, right? Information is something that we have a kind of autonomy over us, but that's within our domain of autonomy. And so we need to, Either we need to consent either explicitly or implicitly in order for the sharing of information to be permissible. Likewise, we think that the acquisition of personal data, the sort that you might give to a social media platform, that's also going to be morally impermissible if there's no kind of background permission structure which makes it morally permissible. And right now, these kind of personal data transactions that we engage in are gov governed by two things. The first is this kind of individual consent paradigm, which we'll talk about more later. And the second is the current regulatory framework, which governs all these interactions. So let's talk about the current regulatory framework for a little bit. Basically, right, there, so there are two main things that might that, that are in the background of this current regulatory environment. One is the GDPR, right? So that, that governs people in the EU, but of course, since the internet is worldwide, it also by default governs a lot of data transactions around the world. The second, as we listed here, is the California Consumer Privacy Act, which again, strictly speaking, only applies to companies doing business in California, but because California is so influential of a, of a state in the United States, that also governs a lot of how data transactions work in the United States. And we won't go into details about how these regulatory, about how this regulatory environment works, but I'll just note a couple of things about this, right? First, both of these, the GDPR and the CCPA, are broadly consistent with what we're going to call the individual consent paradigm. That basically means, like I said, we'll talk about it more in a minute, but that basically means that as far as the GDPR is concerned, as far as the CCPA is concerned, it's still the individual end user who is responsible for consenting to the uploading of their information. And, and, and that consent is required in order for that information to be processed by the, the GDPR, we call it the data controller or the data processor. Uh, that consent is required. Without that consent, that sort of data transaction is impermissible. And what the, CC, what, I'm sorry, what the GDPR tries to do is ensure that every end user has better 
consent, right? That they're more fully informed, that their consent is understood to be revocable, things like that. It's strengthening the sorts of consent requirements that are put on the individual end user. But it's not changing the basic framework, right? Which is that it's still going to be that end user, that controller of the information, that owner of the data, who is responsible for consenting. And the CCPA is slightly different. It actually doesn't have a clear understanding of how consent is required for acquiring information. It does impose various restrictions on companies to not sell uh, information. Sell is a very broad term. It just means kind of pass along to any, anyone else for any kind of value. But both of those are still broadly consistent with the idea that it is the individual end user who is responsible for consenting when information is processed in some way or other. Okay, so for our um, in inquiry into the individual consent paradigm, let's take the example of Facebook. So here you can see um, Facebook's terms of service and the action of consenting is pressing this I accept button, which reflects your agreement with their terms. Um, and in this example, we are assuming that users are owners of data shared on the platform and that their consent is sufficient for personal data transactions to be justified. Next slide. Consent is this incredibly important tool and it does a lot of heavy normative work. It has this kind of moral magic that transforms impermissible acts to permissible ones. And in activities like surgery or sex, consent is a key um, sort of tool to allow individuals to put their autonomy in a vulnerable situation, but with the knowledge that it has strict constraints. And in our project, we're really concerned about whether or not informed individual consent is the right regulatory paradigm to protect autonomy in instances of data transactions. Next slide. So um, let's look at what characterizes legitimate consent. Um, according to Faden and Beecham, there are four criteria. Uh, the first being that the subject have sufficient and accurate information and understand the agreement, that they've entered into it without any kind of coercion, that the agreement is entered into intentionally and knowingly, and that it authorizes a specific course of action. Next slide. Okay, so let's bring this back to the online data transaction example on Facebook. We um, looked at this in our uh, paper and um, sort of held this up to Faden and Beecham's uh, criteria. Um, and we found a couple of issues that really stuck out to us. So the first being that um, terms of service for online platforms like Facebook really task non-experts to consent to something that they don't totally understand, which takes advantage of an asymmetry in their technical and legal knowledge. The second issue is that it's really hard to just opt out of these online platforms. There are these incredibly important social ecologies where people form personhood and maintain relationships and build networked counterpublics. Yet there's really no power to negotiate terms of service with these companies. It's typically presented, um, the terms of service are presented as a take it or leave it proposition where you kind of are deciding about uh, whether or not you're going to be sort of socially crowded by giving away too, information, too much information or to be socially isolated. The third issue is that the sheer volume of consent requests um, these days um, has led to this really unfortunate externality. And this is in part because of some of the regulatory frameworks that are in place um, right now. Um, there's such a deluge of consent requests that the users are fatigued and they are in response to sort of habitually agreeing to all requests. And this really delegitimizes the premise that each act of consent is a, a user's autonomous judgment. And the final issue is that service agreements are just so incredibly broad and flexible for the data processor that it really allows them to do quite a lot of things with your data, but that makes it really hard to track the data lifecycle and hold these processors accountable for misuse. Next slide. And even more key is that data is just frankly very leaky. It moves easily and quickly. Um, information you share on social media also um, may implicate many people who really weren't involved in that initial act of consenting to the platform's terms of service. Yet that platform authorizes you to share that data. So here you can see a snippet of um, Facebook's terms of service that sort of demonstrates that type of language. 
And again, um, let's go back to this opening question that we had talked about at the beginning. Um, so if I share sort of my family photo of me and my brothers, or say something even more sensitive, like our genetic data publicly, did that act of consent or I pressed I agree really make that permissible? Next slide. So we talked about how there's kind of, there are general issues with consent. And these are things that we have worked on, Juniper and I, along with our team, and, and trying to figure out like how exact, what, what exactly would make for proper consent in these data transactions, this data transaction environment. But the specific problem that data are leaky. Right, that's the thing we want to talk about in more detail here. And we think that there's one way of trying to solve that problem of, of the at least one way of approaching different solutions to that problem. And that's by looking through some of the resources that we get from some of the collective action literature. So we can kind of branch out, we can divide the broad theories of collective action into three categories, right? And these aren't going to be particular, you know, these aren't going to be entirely uh, precise categories, but we think that we can divide a lot of the major theories into these categories. The first we can call a kind of fully reductive theory. And this suggests that intentions are individually held and the content of the intentions makes reference only to the individual agent. Right? The idea is that right, you can only intend your own actions as an agent. And so the content of your intention must be referred to only your own actions. Now, this is a, a view which, kind of, which Quentin suggests. This is a view also perhaps that Michael Bratman holds. Again, we won't, we won't quibble too much about whether or not these categorizations are, are quite accurate. There are ways of wondering exactly what kind of view Bratman has, for example, or as we'll see later on, Martin Gilbert has. But these are for kind of intention-based theories of collective action. Uh, you know, and so that's, that's what we're gonna call the fully reductive view. The second category of view is what we're gonna call ontologically reductive, but methodologically non-reductive. And the idea there is that intentions are individually held. So the, the, the agent that holds the intention is an individual agent, but there's something about the intention itself, whether it's the content of the intention or it's the kind of mode of the intention, which does make reference to a non-reducible group. Right? That, that, those are going to be the views that are held by Searle and Tuomala and Liston Pettit and Tollefson, right? perhaps Bratman, depending on how we think about it. And so that's different from the fully reductive view because the intentions themselves are distinct. Right? You, can't, you can't get a collective action on the second category of view just by appealing to ordinary intentions held by ordinary individuals. The last view is kind of fully non-reductive. And the idea there is that intentions are held by a non-reducible group and the content or mode of the intention is also non-reducible somehow, right? So it's, it's a plural subject or a group which, was, which is properly speaking the agent of the intention, the bearer of the intention. And this is, I think at least under one interpretation, this is a view of, this is Margaret Gilbert's view. Although like I said, there's some question for each of these about whether or not that's the right way to categorize them. But we can see when we divide this up into categories that what we're talking about is the distinction between the ontological component and the methodological component, right? With, with respect to the ontological component, the relevant unit of agency is the individual agent or group, right? That determines what the ontological component of the intention is. Whereas the content or mode of the intention determines the methodological component, where you're talking about whether, whether it's an ordinary intention or whether it's an I mode or we mode intention, right? Whether the intention refers just to my actions or the intention refers to the actions of someone else, right? Can I intend Juniper's actions one way or another, right? That is referring to kind of the content or mode of the intention. So let's return now to our talk about consent, right? Given those resources, given that way of structuring the collective action literature, we can ask ourselves, what must the structure of consent be in order for that to be legitimate consent, right? Ontologically, the consent can be either given by an individual or it can be given by a group or collective, right? And methodologically, the thing being consented to can refer either just to kind of information about the individual or can refer to information about the group or collective. And also, right, it can refer to the properties of the individual, it can refer to properties of the group. And whether the group is in principle reducible here is actually less important when we talk about consent than it is when we talk about uh, intentions. So let's return to the individual consent paradigm for a moment, right? The, individual, the ontologically individual and methodologically individual position on consent is basically the individual consent paradigm. You're asking each individual, do you consent to uploading this information? And at least implicit is the idea that the information that you're consenting to uploading is information that you yourself control, right? That it's information that is more or less about you. So the bearer of the consent is the individual and what the consent refers to is also just the individual. This we suggest it is a bit of a non-starter, right? And the problem is because, precisely because data are leaky. I can never consent to uploading information if every bit of information I possess 
also implicates everyone in my social network. And this is actually oftentimes what we see. It's like every bit of information, no matter how benign it seems, is actually implicating many, many people in our networks. And of course, companies rely on this sort of, of these connections in order to target their ads, et cetera. So if that's a non-starter, the individual consent paradigm is a non-starter, then we can ask ourselves, what other resources do we have? One is that we can think about consent as being ontologically individual, but methodologically collective. Right? This would mean that kind of each end user of a platform is being asked to consent to the uploading of data, but the data are not presumed to belong only to the individual. The data can only be uploaded when certain group-ish conditions are met, and that data can only be shared with or transferred to others for whom those group-ish conditions are also met. This is what we're going to call distributed consent. Okay, so if our data is not discrete, which we... Um have just outlined, perhaps maybe our consent should be distributed as well. Um, so a fundamental assumption for individual consent is that the user really has the power over their personal data and can trade this in exchange for their privacy. Um, but as Randall just said, because that data may not be wholly the individual's, it might not be um, appropriate for them alone to control the um, flow of these data. And this is in part because social networks really have these kind of special properties at a meta scale. Um, and an example of this is something called homophily, which gives processors um, a lot of information and predictive power. And this is particularly important in instances of inferred personal data in things we call shadow networks. And this is where a processor um, can actually build an inferred um, digital dossier of somebody who's not even on the social network. Um, and this is with a lot of predictive accuracy. So almost 95% of a person's online profile can be inferred and estimated just by using social ties um, of that individual's um, social network only. And um, this really allows the platform um, to gain a lot of protected information um, about individuals uh, um, who aren't even on the platform and who did not sort of directly consent to share this information. Um, and this could potentially implicate them in um, some harm. Next slide. Okay, so we don't have time to get into the details here, but in our related work, we um, built out a model of what distributed consent may look like on, uh, <laughs> on a platform um, like Facebook. Um, so here we introduce um, uh, some privacy settings um, that um, allow you to um, give consent that's conditional on that of your network neighbors who share a similar taste for privacy that you do. Next slide. And in this um, project, we model and um, see how adoption of distributed consent protects people against surveillance um, and um, forms sort of a protected sub-network on um, the platform. But again, and to drive this home even more, um, data is leaky and there is a problem with this. It does not stop the flow of information across platforms or, and it also doesn't coordinate consent across platforms. Next slide. Our second model um, for this project focuses on coordinated consent across platforms. Um, and I won't get into the details, but um, one of the takeaways is that users who are participating in multiple platforms are really only as secure as their weakest security settings. And this really reveals a larger multi-layer dependency and a systems level problem. So when we're really thinking about the data protection here, we need to consider harms and um, losses of aut autonomy at many different scales. Next slide. So let's think about what's going on here, right? Basically what we have is when, on, on a distributed consent model, what each end user is being asked to do is to give a, provide a kind of conditional consent based on the taste for privacy of their network neighbors. So each person is saying, I will upload this information only to people that also share my particular taste for privacy, my degree of, of privacy concern. And this makes the consent itself kind of conditional on a certain property of the group, right? Namely, the, the, the agreement among the group about what level of privacy they ought to adopt. And that's why we think that this is basically adopting a kind of ontologically individual, but methodologically collective view of consent because you're trying to track the group's view of what consent or privacy should be 
And we think that this is a, a promising uh, option, a promising way to go, but we also think that there are still some problems with it. Now, one is that it doesn't necessarily address all of the general problems with consent that we talked about but earlier, right? You're still not going to solve the problem of making sure that all of the end users are fully informed or all these things. Right? Like that those are still going to be problems. But there are other problems with this model of distributed consent as well, right? One is that the consent itself is still conditional on these groupish properties, right? The taste for privacy of the group. But once any particular node has acquired this information, has acquired these data, then they can still do with it what they will because it's still, like, because the model is still a kind of ontologically individual model, each individual node can decide whether or not to pass along the information that they have once they acquire it, right? And so even though you might have the same taste for privacy, it's still not going to protect you against uh, a, a kind of a, a faithless or attacker node, which can do whatever they want with the data. And that's basically what happened in the Cambridge Analytica case, which I won't get into details now. So there's another option, there's another route that we can pursue, right? Which is to go the fully non-reductive route. In this case, make the agent who has granted consent the group rather than the individual. Now, to do that, to actually implement that, we think, would require that there be some robust, perhaps non-reducible, metaphysical group that is, in fact, granting the consent. So it's no longer the case that each individual node is being tasked with granting consent, conditional or not, right, to this information. Instead, the idea is that it is the group together, it is the collective, who is, which is deciding whether or not to grant consent to the uploading or, or evaluation or transformation or, or, or analysis of that information. So that requires that there actually be a group in the first place, right? Consent, and in that case, consent is gonna be granted by the group through whatever procedure the group uses to act or hold mental states. We're not committed to any particular view of what consent is here. So for large groups, for example, societies writ large, the group acts and holds mental states through the formal constitution of the group. For example, in the United States, the US legislative process, acts of Congress, et cetera, right? So the, the, the CCPA is in fact one such group. And that's basically what the regulatory framework is. For smaller groups, right? You can imagine a group of 20 people on a, on a social media, on a social platform. For smaller groups, the group acts and holds mental states to the extent that the members of the group themselves believe themselves to be bound by the norms of the group as they imagine them, right? Including norms on privacy and group sharing and processing information. So if you can actually figure out when you have a group on these social media sites and what the attitudes or actions of the group are, then you can use those properties of the group to determine whether or not that group has actually consented to the uploading of the information, right? And we think that there are actually, that this is also a promising way to go, at least theorize about, but we do recognize that this is going to be in some ways difficult to operationalize on social networks, right? Like, how do you know, like, how does Facebook, for example, know whether or not all the individuals in this network really constitute a group or not, whether they're really bound by these norms or not? That's going to be very difficult for a platform like Facebook to do. But it is possible, we think, to find some surrogate ways of tracking those properties. And that's part of kind of later work that we have uh, in development. It's like, what are the other surrogate ways of tracking those, you know, whether or not you actually have a robust group, which is capable of granting consent in these online environments. But the main idea here is that on this group consent framework, the data are owned, as it were, by all of us. And so we must all consent to the use of the data in order for the data transactions themselves to be legitimate. And as I said, we don't have time to evaluate this right now. We're happy to talk about it more in the, in the discussion, but we think that this is right now best applied for the regulatory environment rather than the operational environment on social network platforms. But we do think there are ways to actually make it more operationalizable as well. All right, so we apologize for going through this somewhat quickly. We only have so many minutes, but we really, uh, look forward to the discussion. I want to once again, uh, thank our, the other people that are working with, with this broad set of projects we have, Laurent Ebert Dufresne, Antoine Alaw, and Jeremiah Onolapo. And the key takeaway here is that social data is not yours alone. That's what makes it social. So again, thank you very much. We look forward to the discussion.